G'day, I'm James, and here's a very strange question. What does 2 plus 3 plus 4 mean? Huh, well, clearly it's 9, 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 9, but is that what I mean by my question? Who knows what I mean? Um, well, okay, the point is, I want to say there's a couple of ways you can think your way through this particular expression to get the answer 9. For example, I bet most people watching this video thought 2 plus 3 is 5, they went 5, then added the 4 and got 9 that way. But you could also get to 9 by thinking of the 3 and the 4 together first, 3 plus 4 is 7, and then think 2 plus that answer, 2 plus 7 is 9. Of course, no matter how you do it, you'll get 9, but there's actually a couple of different ways to think your way through this, depending how you group the symbols. So in the 1400s, 1500s, people realised they really wanted a symbol for grouping, a really strong symbol that helped you think your way through particular expressions. Maybe you actually need to think through in a particular order for a certain context, who knows. So in the 1400s, people invented the following idea. Suppose I want you to look at this and actually, please do think 2 plus 3 together first and then add 4. They did the following. They put a horizontal bar above the 2 and the 3, say, please group those together, think 5, and then add 4, 5 plus 4, to get 9. Or if they wanted you to think the 3 and the 4 together first, they put a horizontal bar above those, group those together, 3 plus 4 is 7, think 2 plus 7, to then get 9. Great. So people invented this horizontal bar notation for grouping. And they gave it a lovely name, they called it a vinculum. A vinculum, from the Latin for a tie or a bond or a little connective piece, a vinculum. So vinculum meant grouping. And I actually love the vinculum. I kind of wish we had the vinculum still to this day. Because it's so naturally clear, you can just see what to do. If I give you something more complicated like 4 plus 5 plus 2 plus 1, and I did this, I put a vinculum within a vinculum, nested vinculi. You can still see what to do without me telling you anything. Your brain naturally goes to the innermost vinculum. You can't help but say, I want to think 9. Then I want to think 9 plus 2, 11. Then I want to think plus 1, 12. Nest and vinculi actually make sense. Or things can be a little more complicated. For example, if I just say uh, 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 1 plus 8, something like that, and drew this picture for you. Again, I've got vinculi within vinculi, but this one's a little bit sneaky because I've got two equally nested vinculi. Which one am I meant to do first? I don't know. But your brain can't help say, well, they seem equally you know, valuable. I can't help but think 5 and 5, and then go, oh, 5 plus 5 is 10, then do 10 plus 8, 18. So I guess equally nested vinculi can just be done simultaneously. Or maybe want some rule about do them left to right or right to left, but it doesn't matter. Just do the two nested vinculi equally well. Grand. So even vinculi within vinculi are fine. In fact, things can be totally beastly. Let me do a horrid, horrid example to show how visually clear the vinculum actually is. Um, let's do this one. I have no way do I want to actually work this out because it's going to be long and not fun. But the point is the thinking. Uh, ta -da. How's that? Is that long enough? Yes. All right. So now you, you have the advantage of watching me do this, but imagine you weren't watching me do this. You just walked in on this picture, which I'm finishing up right now. Do, 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 do. Whoa, crazy, but I think you can see what's happening. All right, there is an insane picture. Apparently I'm meant to think of this sum in a very particular order, and I think the picture makes your brain just do what's naturally right, what it wants you to do. You can't help but notice the innermost vinculum is five plus four, you must think nine. The next one up is one plus nine, you must think 10. Next one up it says 10 plus three, makes you think 13. Then it thinks 13 plus the seven, 20, and off we go, plus the eight, plus the three, uh, plus the seven, plus the, oh, where am I, plus the nine, plus the eight, plus the one, and off we go, two plus all that. Grand. Vinculum within vincula a piece of cake. How visually clear that is, even though that looks like a nightmare at first. It's clear when you actually sit down and try to think, think its way through. All right, so that's the 1400s, 1500s. People have this lovely horizontal bar to, to work with grouping. But then in the 1500s and 1600s, people started using a second symbol for grouping. And it's, it's kind of sneaky. Suppose I wanted you to think 2 plus 3 first and then add 4. So instead of doing a horizontal bar, People actually also started using parentheses. Think of this as 5 plus 4 to get 9. Or if they want to go the other way around, think of 3 and 4 grouped together first, 2 plus 7, think of it that way by putting parentheses around the 3 and the 4. So parentheses started being used in the 1500s and 1600s at the same time. Okay, which is curious, because if you do something as big and beastly, now it truly is big and beastly. Now, you have the advantage of watching me make up this example, but imagine you just walked into the room on this one after I've finished. Whoa.
Okay, okay. Now you just saw me do this. You know how my brain was constructing this. But imagine walking this cold and saying, please evaluate that in the order indicated by the parentheses. Whoa, this is a big deal for young students learning about nested parentheses. Now, we adults have been, we've trained our minds to be able to read these things fairly swiftly, but that's after 10, 20, 30 years of like doing this over and over and over again. For a young student, this is very hard. But here's a good pedagogical advice, a piece of advice. I see a lot of teachers do this. They advise the students, we give a complicated expression with lots of nested parentheses. Look for the innermost parentheses first, the innermost ones, there they are, and underline them. Then go for the next innermost ones and underline those. And then go for the next innermost ones and underline those, uh, which is this one. Then go for the next innermost one and underline those. And the next innermost one, and next innermost one, next innermost one, and so on, so on. In the end, we end up drawing more vinculi. In fact, the pedagogical approach is go back to vinculum and see what's going on, literally see what's going on. Now, as you mentioned, in the 1400s, 1500s, people sometimes put their vinculi underneath, sometimes put them on top. The notation was all over the place a little bit. That's fine, but either way, it's clear what you do. I love the vinculum, it makes mathematics so easy and clear. So what happened? What made people stop from writing this, uh, two plus three plus four with a vinculum, and going two plus three plus four with parentheses? Why the difference? Because in the end, here we are in the 21st century, we're doing this, we're not doing that anymore. So something changed. What happened in the history of mathematics? Well, actually, this goes back to the 1400s again, because the printing press was invented in the first time, the year uh, 1440 or so, uh, the Gutenberg Press. And the idea is they could actually now start printing books. They could print novels, they could print science books, they could even print mathematics books, and they did. But here's the thing, think about how a printing press was first made. The idea was you had a great big wooden table, and what you do, if you want to print some text, like here's some text here, you need to have individual metal tiles or wooden tiles, one for each symbol, one for each letter, one for each punctuation mark, one for each number, each one for math symbol, and so on. So to print a page of text, they'd lay out all the tiles for that text on that wooden table, cover that those tiles with ink, take a piece of paper, lay it down, Voila, you have a page of your book. You can do it again like 20 times and get 20 pages for the book and then put all the pages together and make the book. Great, great. But think about math books. The vinculum, the vinculum. Yes, I had a tile for two, a tile for plus, the tile for three, a tile for plus, a tile for four, and I could lay those out. But that vinculum is half a line off. It's a, like between lines, very awkward. So when you're lying tiles, you cut, there's no space between the tiles. So what they have to do is they have to first lay out all the tiles without the vinculum, no vinculum. Cover it with ink, get the piece of paper, put it down, voila, make your copies. Then they have to go back, clear all the tiles, and put special vinculum tiles and all the special half line marks, all the vinculum that are missing. They have to go back, re-ink, take the page, page you had before, make sure the alignment's perfect, and get those vinculum to print in exactly the right spot. That is a pain. That was a horrible thing to have to do. So mathematicians said, look, we need notation throughout our, our discipline that keeps all symbols on the same lines. All you need is just a row of tiles and you'll be fine. Do a parentheses tile, a two, a plus tile, a three tile, a parentheses tile, plus tile, and so on. This kept all the tiles in the same row, made printing so much easier. And here we are 400, 500 years later, still doing this because of the mechanical printing press. But here's the funny thing, in this day and age, Typing a vinculum is no problem on a computer. You can type it very easily. So the reason for this is now out the window. We can now do a vinculum if you want. But the funny thing is, the vinculum didn't actually go, go away completely. We are still using the vinculum today. In fact, you probably think of some examples. Let's try this one. Here's a symbol. It's a symbol you've seen, but you probably don't realize you've seen it. Hmm, just looks like a check mark. It actually has a great name. It's actually called a radix. Lots of good Latin names here, radix, R-A-D-I-X, sorry my handwriting. And if I wrote radix, say, 9, it's actually the symbol for square root. It's asking for the square root of 9, which is 3. Okay, but the thing is, you don't normally see the check mark all by itself. That, that, you know, that's not the square root symbol, James Tanton. What's going on? Well, actually, here's the reason. Because if I wrote radix 9 plus 16, now we have some confusion. Does that mean the square root of 9, which is 3, plus 16 to get me the answer 19? Or does it mean the square root of 9 plus 16, the square root of 25, and the square root of 25 is uh, 5? Does it mean that? There's ambiguity there. So people said, oh, oh, oh that radix, that's a, that's a confusing symbol. So people said, OK. If you meant the square root of uh, 9 plus 60, if you actually meant the square root of 25 to get the answer 5, let's put this with a vinculum, say, I want to group the 9 and the 16 together. 
Voila, that now definitely reads the square root of 9 plus 16, the square root of 25, it definitely reads as 5. Or, so that's this one, okay, it's a bit confusing, or if you just really literally meant square root of 9 then plus 16, you might just want to put a grouping symbol over the 9 and meant, no, no, I really meant the 9 is its own little thing, stop there, it's its own group in some sense, this would be the square root of 9 plus uh, 16 is 19. So we actually use the vinculum in the square root symbol. Most people don't realize that that symbol is really two separate symbols, the square root symbol and the vinculum. And there it is, it's a vinculum. Uh, another place we see the vinculum is in repeating decimals. Uh, if I wrote something like this on the board, 0.582 with a horizontal bar above the eight and two, the standard convention is that means, oh, think of the eight and the two as a little group unto itself that gets repeated infinitely often. This means the decimal point 5, H2, 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 and so on and so on and so on. There, another use of the vinculum for grouping. Um, another place, this is a very lovely happy coincidence, in geometry. In geometry, we often give points names like capital letters A, point A and point B. And you might want to draw a line segment that connects them. It often happens in geometry. And the notation we use for that, and this is kind of deliberate, is actually just give the uh, get the two names of the points, A and B, and use a vinculum, which happens to look like a line segment, to connect them to say, that's the notation for the line segment that connects points A and B. Crazy! Um, there's one other place you might be thinking we use the vinculum all the time. This one. In fractions. The answer historically is actually no, no. What we're seeing there is not a vinculum. So if I wrote something like three fifths, uh, we have a numerator three, a horizontal bar, and a denominator five. Yes, that's fraction notation, but this has its own history independent of the vinculum. Actually, it goes back to the 1100s. So uh, mathematics was very strong in the Middle East during the, this period, and an Islamic scholar, Al Hassan, actually was the first to start saying, hey on everyone, let's use this notation for fractions. He invented the idea of having a numerator, a denominator, separate a horizontal bar. He says this is a great way to represent fractions as it makes the math so much easier to read and to do. So he actually invented the symbol for fractions quite independent of the story of the vinculum. And then in the 1200s, um, a, a very famous mathematician in the, in the West, Fibonacci, actually was spent a lot of time in this part of the world and saw this incredible mathematics that this is what these Islamic scholars were doing and wrote books about it. And he brought those books back to Europe and this idea really took on in Europe. People said this is a brilliant way to write fractions and people did. So we had that horizontal bar there and it was actually called a Virgula. Virgula. The v, sorry, handwriting here, hang on. V-I-R-G-U-L-A, from the Latin for twig or something like that. But again, it has suffered the same problem. That printing press, fractions in that notation are very awkward to print with little tiles on a wooden board. So we said, okay, so where do we take this notation and make it all fit on one line? And people started doing this. They used a, horizontal, a, a diagonal dash as line instead. And this also became known had its own name, also became known as a Virgula, but also it's became known as a Solidus. So lots of Latin words here. But it's, it's a little bit confusing here. Some people do, do call this a Virgula, some people don't. Look at the history of Matthew, so it's a little bit confused. But there we are. It's a different story. It's a different story. But the thing is, I still love the vinculum thinking when it comes to upper level mathematics that involves complex fractions in algebra. Let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what I mean. So here is a very complex fraction indeed. 16 plus 20 over, I know, um, 4 plus 1 all over 3 plus 7. There's fractions within fractions. But, but, if I am thinking, if I'm thinking in a vinculum mindset, I can't help but notice like nested vincula. There's a vinculum within a vinculum right there. Which is lovely because this first vinculum says, which I want to focus on, all oh, at 4 plus 1. I should think of that as its own little group and I should work that out first. So I'm going to do that. This is 16 plus 20 over 5 and 3 plus 7 is still on the bottom. Uh, 20 divided by 5, that's 4, so this is really 20, uh, 16 plus 4, that's 20 on the top, so this is really 20 on the top, and 3 plus 7. And now I've got this vinculum that says, oh, I better do the 3 plus 7 as a little group, it's actually 10. So this is 20 plus 10, all over 10, all over, which is 2. Beautiful. I love it. Vinculum thinking can help with very complex fractions. And to give a hint of this more, it actually helps with algebra students when you start doing algebra in you know, upper middle school, high school, and so forth. Here's a very common dangerous point. If I said, please make 2x plus 6 divided by 2 look simpler, it is very, very tempting for beginning students to say, oh, a 2 and a 2, cross them out, and write, this is x plus 6. Very tempting. I'm with you. It seems tempting. 
But here's the thing. If we give the story the vinculum, you can't help but notice vinculum thinking going on here. This 2x plus 6 is all one group. So it means if you divide things by 2, you can't just divide part of the group by 2. The whole group is a group. Everything in that group has to get divided by 2. So the way to think of this is 2x plus 6 is one group that gets divided by 2. So that part of the group gets divided by 2. And that part of the group divided by 2. Don't leave out parts of the group. The whole group gets divided by 2. And you see it must be x plus 3. Beautiful. That's correct. Unfortunately, that temptation is incorrect. The power of thinking about the vinculum. You've just got to love it. Okay, let's end off with the fun puzzles called counting the vinculum numbers. Okay, so here's a sum of two terms, A plus B. I could use numbers, I'll just use A and B. There's only actually one way to put a vinculum around those, namely put them on top of A plus B. Think of that as a group. So a, two, a sum of two terms is one way to put vinculums on it. But with a sum of three terms, we've actually seen today there are two ways to put vincula on top of that. You can think of the first two terms first, then add C, or you can think of the second two terms, the last two terms first, and then A plus that answer. So there's actually two ways to put a vinculum over three terms so that you're always adding two things at a time. So let's keep going then. Sum of four things, A plus B plus C plus D. How many ways can I put vincula over that so I'm only ever summing two things at a time? Well one way could be I could do A and B and then take that answer and add C and then take that answer and add D. So there's one way. Um, what else could I do? Maybe I could start with B and C and then go A plus that answer then that answer plus D. Oh, actually that makes me think I can do another way to do B and C first, and then that answer plus D, and then A plus that. Uh, what else could I do? I could do A plus B plus C plus D, I could do C and D first, and then B plus that, and then A plus that. And actually there's one more way to do it, it's a sneaky one. I could do this thing. I could do A and B and C and D simultaneously, and then do those. There's another way. Each vinculum is only adding two terms, and that counts. Great. Um, and if you think about it, this actually it. There's only five ways to do a sum of our four terms with vinculum. All right, so the vinculum numbers are one, two, five. Now I'll give it away, but if I gave you a sum of five terms, A plus B plus C plus D plus E, I claim there are 14 ways to put vinculum around that, so you're only ever adding two things at a time. Can you find all 14 ways for a sum of five terms? Can you write them out? Whoa, and if you're really game, of course, A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. How many ways could you put vinculi around a sum of six terms? What are the vinculum numbers? One, two, five, 14, something. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Why not, why not? Just have fun with this. If you actually get all 14 ways here, you understand grouping very well. You're on top of it. What you could do is rewrite all this in terms of parentheses so it looks like a modern textbook for today, or not. All good stuff. Thanks so much.